I think that development platform really helped me because I had so many people that my dad brought into our environment that helped us get to where we wanted to go because we got to see it. When you see something and you can ultimately believe that you can one day reach it. Hey everyone, welcome back to Oh My Curry Goodness. I'm your host Hamza Islam and this is a podcast where I talk to Gen Zers who are making a difference in their communities about their journey and how they became the person they are today. I want to be able to talk to them about what it's like to be them and how they see life from their perspective. And I hope that you guys as a listener join me in taking a few things away from each guest on this on this podcast as we continue to write our own story. Now, my guest this week is Brianna Pinto, who is a midfielder for the North Carolina Courage of the National Women's Soccer League, and in addition, also plays for the U.S. Under-23 National Women's, Women's National Team. She has competed in such tournaments such as the Under-17 and the Under-20 FIFA Women's World Cup, and in addition to her soccer career, she has also been involved in activism. She has her own foundation known as the Pinto Football Foundation, where she invests in grassroots programs designed to grow soccer in underserved communities domestically and around the world. I am super excited and jealous at the same time because I wanted to become a professional soccer player, but that's not the case. But nevertheless, Brianna Pinto, thank you so much for joining the Oh My Curry Goodness podcast. Thank you for having me. It's super special to be a part of this podcast because you get to meet with a lot of interesting people and I'm excited to share my story. Yeah. And speaking of interesting, let's talk about the athletic career because I like I said, I wanted to become one, but never became the case. That didn't become the case. However, I do think I'm not the only one that thinks that way because there are so many people that want to be a professional athlete. It doesn't matter which sport, but they always had that dream. And yet only a handful get to actually pursue that. As someone who is a professional soccer player, talk me through that mindset of what it was like to pursue this dream when, at the beginning. Were you someone that worried a lot about whether you were going to be a professional soccer player at the end of the day, or were you someone that just tried to think about, okay, how can I be better today than I was yesterday? And what are some things I can work on tomorrow so that I can be a better player than today? I definitely think in my journey, I fall somewhere between both mindsets, the mindset of getting better every day, but then also worrying about whether I was going to be a professional. Um, I've had a lot of success from a young age. And I think a lot of that is due to the fact that I come from a sports background. My parents both played collegiately um, at the University of North Carolina. My mom played softball, my dad played soccer, and then both my brothers played collegiately and professionally as well. So we kind of had each other to lean on um, during the ups and downs of our youth and uh, collegiate journeys up until professional. And um, I think for me, when I was younger, I wanted to become better just because I love the game. I love being out there. I love competing. I love getting to play against my brothers when we were growing up. Um, and it made me tough and it taught me so many lessons about how to work with other people towards a collective goal. Um, but as I got older, uh, probably around the age of 12, when I attended my first youth national team camp with the U14 girls, um, it became real that I could do this for a living. Um, I got to become immersed in the U.S. soccer environment and see players like the Megan Rapino, the Mia Hams, the Christine Lillies, the Crystal Duns of the world. And um, I got to see them living out a dream that I once had and am still living out. And I think for me, once I got a taste of that, I was like, this is what I want for the rest of my life. I want to be a professional soccer player. So then it kind of switched. What can I do uh, to become better every single day so that I can ultimately reach that? But also, how can I make sure that this dream never slips through my fingers. And um, to be here today has just been a blessing. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's about finding that passion and what is that thing you want to do. But I also, and I think you bring up an interesting point, which is that even if you are passionate about something, you still have to work on pursuing that because there are going to be a lot of ups and downs. Um, but it is a much better journey to take than doing something that I guess you have to do, but you don't really want to do inside. And then that journey is much more difficult. But when you want to do something because it's coming from you personally, it's much better. And even if there are obstacles in your way, it doesn't matter because you're willing to embrace them. And I think that's what makes the journey interesting is the ups and downs. But ultimately, these are the things that shape you into who you are today and who you want to be in the future. But I, I want to talk about your family because I know you talked about this a lot because how much they mean so much to you. And obviously coming from a sports background, 
uh, does help your case. But tell me a bit about how much your family has helped you into who you are today, because you know, you obviously are a professional soccer player. You've met so many amazing people. You got to work with a lot of people. But when you first started out, your real fans, if we can say, have always been your family and your brothers. And that's not what we really get to understand, especially from an athletics perspective, where you guys have a lot of fans, but it's also easy to forget that your first fans were your family or those who believed in you when you were just starting out in the beginning. Yeah, I, I really love how you ended that question, the fact that they believed in you before anybody else. And I think for any elite sport or actually any skill that you take on, somebody's got to invest in you and want to see you be successful. And those are my parents. Um, so they emphasize the importance of education and athletics. They gave us two options. We have to do great in school and they have to do great in a sport. They didn't care what sport it was, but it, hopefully it would be something they have played themselves so that they could guide us on how to become great at it. Um, I played t-ball, I played softball, I played tennis and basketball, cross country and soccer is what stuck. Um, and uh, fortunately for me, um, my first goal before ever becoming a professional soccer player became to the picture. It was to attend UNC. I wanted to be like my parents. They were both student athletes at the University of North Carolina. Um, and I got to see what a special place it was where there were so many talented individuals who were chasing national championships. They were chasing an incredible degree that's respected around the world. And I wanted to be a part of that. So my parents made it a point to bring my brothers and I around um, two great universities because Duke comes into the picture later, but Duke and Carolina, and we got to see these college athletes live out their lives. And um, for me, that was the first goal. I wanted to play for Anson Dorrance, who actually recruited my dad before he moved to the women's program full time. Um, and then with my mom, I, I I wanted to have the network that she got because she has also worked in the sports wor world at ESPN and Major League Baseball. And um, I know that whether I was involved in a professional level of sport, I'd want to be in, involved in some capacity. So whether that's working um, in production or like being a, a sideline host, my mom wanted to create those opportunities for me as well. So to get into back to my family, um, they were just my biggest support system because we got to see people living out their dreams. And one of the special things Chapel Hill is that there's this pickup group, which I still participate in today called Noonball. And back when my dad was still playing, even after his career had long ended, um, he would bring my brothers and I out to this pickup group. And it consisted of UNC men's and women's coaches and former players, and they'd show us how to play. Now, as a 10 year old, I, it was hard to keep up, but I was learning the game because I was seeing seasoned professionals work through the game. I saw they had the way they were thinking. I saw their tactical understanding of the game. And as I got older, um, I got to learn the game from the best. And I think that development platform really helped me because I had so many people that my dad brought into our environment that helped us get to where we wanted to go because we got to see it. When you see something and you can ultimately believe that you can one day reach it. So uh, long story short, my brothers and I pushed each other. We wanted to be um, division one collegiate athletes. We wanted to play professional and we were immersed in an environment that, that fostered that development that we needed. And I'm so grateful for not only my family because they drove all over the United States to help us make our dreams a reality. They invested so much money and time and love and care into us through the ups and the downs when recruiting processes were, were difficult, when through injuries, um, through all kinds of mental struggles, they were there for us from day one. So, um, to be here today playing as a professional, um, is just a testament to the blessings that they've given us and just the love and care that they've shown us all these years. So I'm really proud that my brothers and I achieved our goals of all three becoming professionals because not a lot of people can say that. So it's, it's really something unique that our family shares. Yeah. I, I, First of all, I love the fact that you really broke it down into how much your family means to you and, and not just from the for the good parts like, yes, we are your number one fans, but also, I guess, through that, that difficult journey you have to take as an athlete, like, okay, if you want to be a soccer player, you got to learn from the best, you got to be able to figure out like, these are the things I need to do to not only be at the level or be an athlete, but also be the best athlete possible. And it's really cool that you you also come from a that not only you are a professional athlete but your brothers are as well and i want to give a special shout out to your younger brother because i'm wearing a columbus crew sweatshirt 
and we are huge rivals with FC Cincinnati. And if you guys, if anyone in the the listener doesn't understand, think of and if you guys are a soccer fan, think of Columbus Crew and Cincinnati as I would say Manchester United versus Manchester City, where there's that huge in-state or local rivalry. So um, shout out to your younger brother, but I wish you joined Columbus. Um, I'm kidding. But <laughs> I actually have a small interjection. So I love the analogy that you just gave. Um, my brother and I, my older brother, Hassan, who played for Duke for his grad year, we kind of had that same kind of rivalry where it was the Duke and Carolina rivalry uh, because both campuses are eight miles apart. So for the first time in my life, I had to wear a Duke jersey to support my brother when he came to play at Carolina. This is Hassan Pinto. So um, I, I like seeing the rivalry because it, it, add so much energy to sports so i'm really looking forward to seeing fc cincinnati uh compete against columbus crew yeah and it, i mean i know cincinnati like I, I as much as i hate them i'm also glad that we have them as a rivalry because there is that in-state um uh, matchup I, and i don't know because i know you're someone from north carolina i don't know if you feel that same way when it's north carolina versus south carolina because for us our rivalry our next rivalry would be columbus crew and chicago fire but that's in two different states. So having an in-state Duke in North Carolina, especially both teams who are really good at whatever program that may be, it makes the matchup much more sweeter, if that makes sense. Yeah, because you share the same community. You've got fans who interact with each other on a day daily basis and it's who gets the bragging rights and I think that's the special thing I remember being in elementary school and um, class would end um, early so we could watch Duke Carolina play and uh, that was so special because some kids would wear their Duke shirts and of course I was decked out in Carolina blue and um, to to be a part of that rivalry years later was really special yeah I can't imagine but speaking to your family before we talk about something else um, obviously especially as an athlete your goal is to win, regardless of what it, what sport it may be. And even if you are able to score a goal, it makes it better. But when you have family as part of those, as part of the group that's cheering you on, do you feel like it adds more pressure on you to be the best version of you? Or do you feel like it's less pressure? Because these are the people that know who you are better than anyone else. But at the same time, it's family. They can also be the most critical of any, of, of all the fans of that, if if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important question. My family is definitely the, the most critical on me because they know where I want to go and they know what I'm capable of. And I think that's like a, a really tough balance at times. But I think my family has been really supportive through it all. They have pushed me um, towards greatness and that belief that I've needed at times because confidence wavers over a course of a career. Um, and, you know, if you're in a lull with like trying to score, uh, my parents would always remind me that you can do it. You've got the skill set to do it. You've practiced this a thousand times. If I need to fine tune any um, technical abilities, like finishing inside the box, uh, my runs off the ball, they'll go and work with me on it. Um, but I think it ultimately, I think it relieves a lot of pressure because at the end of the day, you're doing it because you love it. Um, but one of the cool things that my parents did, um, I, I think prepared me for the professional level was, uh, they used to reward goals with ice cream. Like I loved ice cream. I still do to this day. I have probably have it, um, multiple times a week. And anytime anybody in the family scored a goal, uh, we'd all celebrate it. So if I scored a goal one given weekend, whole family would go out for ice cream. And if there were multiple goals, we just one trip, but you know, I think that, made us strive to achieve. And now that I'm a professional, it's money. So, mm. you know, you want to strive to make a living at end this, and you want to get starts and you want to get goals because that's the mindset they were teaching us at a young age that you can go a lot of great places with this game if you perform, because at the end of the day, a professional sport is about performance. And I, I'm really grateful that they motivated us in that way um, because it was just a fun way to get the family together to celebrate one another when we did achieve success. And that's not to say when we didn't score, it wasn't still special, um, but it's just like, how can we have that moment together as a family? I'm going to work as hard as I can to get this in the back of the net. Yeah. And, and it is interesting because as an athlete, it is about performing. It's about being better um, 1% every day. And there's no doubt that you've had a very strong mindset, even from early on when you uh, early on in your soccer career let's say soccer career because like we're also include college and high school as well and i say that because you have competed in the under 17 and under 20 women's world cup which 
is um it's a world it's a tournament that not a lot of people either know about or pay attention to because ultimately regardless if it's men's or women's they prefer focusing on the senior national team and it's weird because this year is the 2023 fifa women's world cup which i know is exciting but for you what is it like to be able to compete in these tournaments because it's it, it kind of puts you into context in that like i said when we when we were little we think about becoming a professional athlete but then when you see that there's an under 17 under 20 world cup then you realize oh so now there are the best 17 20 year olds even if you think you're good there are other people that i guess maybe better quote unquote and so what is it like to be able to compete in these tournaments and also play against people who are from different countries and seeing the best athletes or best soccer players from those respective countries I think that was an integral part of my development growing up. I'm so grateful to U.S. soccer and everything they've invested in me thus far uh, because I had the most amazing childhood, if you will, from age 12 to like now uh, where I've represented the youth national teams and I've gotten to travel all across the world um, to go compete for the national team. So getting that, that first taste at age 12, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like getting to fly on planes and meet all these different people, train with the best of the best, be among these amazing coaches who are going to push you. I wanted that every day. And I did everything I could to get invited back each and every single time. So at the younger ages, U14, it's more like training camp. But as you move into the U17 and U20 levels, that's when the competition becomes more serious because there's a World Cup on the line and you have to make the roster. Um, But going back to my dreams as a kid, um, another one of my dreams was not only to attend the University of North Carolina, but I wanted to travel the world. So my parents reminded me that if you kick this ball, this is a global game, it'll take you anywhere. And I stuck with that and I took it to heart because I was like, I get to I have a chance to compete in a World Cup at age 16 at that at that time, because I was playing a year up with the 99s. And um, to go to Jordan was truly one of the most tremendous, tremendous experiences in my lifetime, um, because the country was beautiful. The food was amazing. Um, getting to see the culture there was so, so special. And I otherwise would not have gone to Jordan. Um, I remember being in high school at the time and telling like all my friends, yeah, I'm going to Jordan for World Cup. And they're like, Jordan, like what's there? And I had so much to share because it's so rich in culture. And um, the tournament was special because you get to play against against so many girls from other countries who have the same dreams as you. They want to become the best footballers in the world and they have a passion for the game. And I think that really that really stimulated my mindset to like give back. Um, throughout my journey, um, specifically with Pinto Football Foundation, because I started to realize the privilege that we had at U.S. Soccer and the amount of resources that were being invested at youth levels for women's teams, um, whatever it may be across the world. And I saw the the gap between the U.S. and everybody else. And I was like, how can I be a part of that change to make sure that these girls get the, the newest uniforms, get the proper care on and off the field? Um, because that really did stick, stick out to me when I did go to those youth tournaments. Um, but beyond that, I, my parents of course came to support me at the U17 and U20 tournaments and we stayed after, and I got to go to Petra and it was so incredible being in Jordan and Israel and getting to see just the rich culture that was there. Um, so I can't stress it enough. Everybody's got to go to the Middle East because it's beautiful. Um, but to answer your question, I truly believe that soccer unites people in a way that little else can because it's a global game and it offers a level playing field, no matter your socioeconomic background, no matter your ethnic background, your age, um, your gender, it allows us to come together as one and celebrate a sport we love. Yeah, I, I like the fact that, well, before I talk about the global aspect, so when I was little, I think it was the 2010 World Cup that inspired me to go, hey, I'm gonna become a professional soccer player. And then it was the 2015 under 20 men's world cup where I was like, wait, there's a youth world cup. And then there's the, these athletes that I've got to compete with. So that kind of put into context on how much, while it's important to invest in the senior national teams, it's also extremely important to be able to focus on the youth national teams and make sure that they are suited for the future. But I, I like how you also bring up the fact that it's not just a soccer game, but it, or for the United States, it's also a global thing and learning about different cultures and understanding how different it is compared to what you may see in media and news. And you go and you realize, wow, it's 
like whatever is on the news, that's that's not it's nowhere near the full story. And as someone who's South Asian, I remember when the um, the under seventeen women's World Cup was in India, and so being able to give a a platform for countries that don't probably have those resources compared to like you said the United States it is really special to see from FIFA. And I'm glad that there are people like you that are not obviously you want to win the game at the end of the day, but you define success as an athlete or you win as an athlete when you see that the people that don't usually get the resource, they usually don't have the resources are able to get it because when, when these teams win or when these certain countries win, everyone wins. And I think that's what makes soccer a global sport. I don't know if that made sense, but I think that's really what makes soccer special. It definitely did. And I think I, in my experience that was so eye opening was I got to go to um, China, Dian, China, and we played in an international tournament against Iran and China and Japan, I believe. And getting to compete against the Iranian girls was so special because you could see the joy on their faces. This was the first time they had a um, international youth like um, appearance, like at a game, a match. So um, we had done it, you know, a thousand times what it felt like at that point, but to see them have their first experience and see them get the investment that they've deserved for so long for the first time was just so eye opening because it made me realize how much I had, my teammates had, um, but it also wanted, it made us wanted to encourage them because they were talented. They love the game just as much as anybody else. And um, I think it was really refreshing to see pure joy on the field because you know, in our environment with the U.S., it's such a competitive place to be because you're with the best of the best. And I think a lot of us forget to smile. Um, those 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 moments don't come so often, like getting to compete in a World Cup or an international tournament. But I think at the end of the day, everybody plays it because they love it. But um, I think sometimes in an environment as competitive as that, we forget the joy. And I think that was a really nice reminder of why we all began. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I do hope that especially with this upcoming World Cup, that countries that usually don't, I, I I say this, I want the US to win the World Cup. Don't get me wrong, I think we all do. But I do hope that the countries that I guess are often overlooked are able to shock the world in any way. I remember like, and just an example, just for the men's World Cup, I remember when Morocco made it to the semifinals and you're just like, wait, what, what happened? <laughs> and so exactly. I, <laughs> I think it's always special to see countries that who, want to be able to pursue this this sport and show the world who they are. I think that's really special to see. And, you know, I, I know that the World Cup, regardless if it's men or women, it's um it's really special to be able to see the joy that certain countries have and um just play their hearts out and represent their countries in whatever way that may be. But you've obviously been able to play in these tournaments and you grew up with a lot of athletes who, like you, are doing really amazing things. But you mentioned this in the beginning when you were talking about how you're able to com- work with the Megan Rapinos of the world, the uh, Heather O'Reilly's of the world. And it's weird because as a fan, when we meet athletes like you, we become like, we're like, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't believe we're meeting so-and-so. For you, when you're able to meet, whether that's Megan Rapino, Alex Morgan, Carly Lloyd, Heather O'Reilly, the list goes on and on. Obviously, you know your worth because you are a professional athlete. But are you someone who also has that fan moment where you go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it's you? Or are you like, I'm in the same boat as you. I'm here. I'm, you don't intimidate me. I think when I was younger, most definitely, I had that fangirl moment. Um, and that's not to say that it has disappeared. I, I respect what they do because they're the best of the best and they've been on top for so long. So um, I, I actually, um, Alex Morgan gave me her cleats when I was 14. It was like the night before I was going to go to a youth national team turn uh camp actually and she signed them at wake med which is my current home field and um it was so special because i got to see somebody i essentially looked up to um and i got to take home their cleats and um of course i had bragging rights when i went to camp because everybody's like you have alex morgan's cleats that's so cool but um you know all these years later i'm I'm playing against her in the end of Ucell. and um you mentioned heather o'reilly she's been a huge source of inspiration because um, she knows how to compete and she knows how to win and she's done it at every level. And, um, I just love Heather because she's so invested in seeing the younger generation, um, be successful. And, 
uh, I've been able to train with her during off season. And I just am so grateful for her support of me and um, being able to watch her career as well. Um, and then in my first professional season, I got to play with Carly Lloyd and um, she was, you know, unfortunately playing her last season, uh, but it was special to see her cap off such a remarkable career. So um, again, I, I admire all of these people because they've, they've worked for everything that they've gotten in their careers and um, they left, a, they've left a positive mark on the world. And I also think that it's nice that you're able to just, yes, you have your fan moments, but you're also being able to go, you know, I'm here to become the best. And I think that's the best thing you can do because if you want to be like, and you mentioned this in the beginning, if you want to become the best, you got to be with the best and you can't let the, I guess the, the status of the person really get to you in any way. So I, I, that's really cool. I, I want to add one more thing. And I think yeah. as I spent more time with them, I realized that they're just people. They're people like you and I who had dreams um, and who were willing to sacrifice anything and everything to get there. Uh, but again, I want to be the best. And in order to do that, you got to be willing to learn. And um, I want to take bits and pieces that have made them great and add it to my game. And the younger I can do that, uh, the more I'll grow at a faster rate. So uh, I'm just really grateful to be in an environment where I get to interact with these women. Yeah. And also I, I want to add one more thing. It's really cool that you're able to say that even though we are, you guys are athletes, you are also human beings at the end of the day. And I remember when I was little and I said this to another athlete on this podcast, where I used to think that if you're an athlete, you guys have security guards or butlers and everything, because it's like, you guys are athletes, but it's also very easy to forget that you guys are human beings and that the journey that you had was a difficult journey it wasn't like you were born to have you weren't you weren't born and it's not like you were like you're gonna be a soccer player like everything's gonna work out because you also had to work for everything and here you are now but as an athlete and one of the things uh i want to ask you personally is that when when people have this idea of becoming a professional athlete one of the criticisms i normally would hear is that what how does that help the world become a better place. And, and it's it's weird because I think anyone who pursues a passion, there's a reason why they pursue that passion. It's not because of the money. It's not because of the fame, because there's something in them that they feel like if they're able to do this, they're able to impact some one person or whoever, or whoever that may be. As an athlete, how has this helped you in becoming the person you are today? Is there something that if you weren't an athlete, you would not have this particular trait. Yeah, I think that comes from looking up to other decorated athletes. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is Serena Williams. She was unapologetically herself, even when the tennis world could told her she couldn't be um, herself. And she embraced it and she rose to the top. And I've always admired that because the lack of diversity in a sport like that um, was somewhat apparent in the last couple of last decade of soccer in America. And um, I wanted to be a part of that change. And I think one, one of the special things about athletics is you have a platform to stand for something, to change the world, because you've got all these eyes on you and all these people that look up to you. And um, I think every athlete is obligated to use that platform for good, um, to change the world, to inspire the next generation. And um, ultimately at the end of the, my career, I went to win as much as I can. I want to become the best version of myself. I want to um, play for the national team and win World Cup and Olympics. Those are all goals. However, a success for me is doing all of that in, in addition to leaving a legacy so that I leave it better than I found it. And I get so much joy from sharing my experiences with others so that they can one day have this. And um, I want to inspire girls to embrace competition because it it inspires um, excellence and it creates an environment where uh, you're not afraid to fail because you pick yourself back up and work at it again. And if we can encourage more women to embrace that or girls at a young age, they'll go into the business world and claim space and do so unapologetically and they'll change the world. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with the fight for equity, um, for racial equity, for um, the gender pay gap in um, the corporate and uh, world of athletics. We're, we're fighting for things like that. And I think sports are a microcosm of the world. All the problems that you see in the world do uh, permeate and um, 
replicate in the world of sports. So we have an obligation to try and address that in the best way we can. We just saw the equal pay fight with the U.S. Women's National Team, and that made tides in uh, America and across the world because a group of women came together and demanded what they were worth and more because they fought for it for years. So I think it was really, really powerful to see. But to answer your question, I think for me, not only winning is, is, is important, but also leaving that legacy. Yeah. I love the legacy part where it's not just, it's about winning on the field, but also winning off the field as well. And you, I, I mentioned, you mentioned Serena Williams. She has done that many times throughout her career. So I, I do hope that that's, that's something that you end up doing or end up doing in the future. But it actually does lead me to my next thing, which is about the idea of changing the world or impacting the world. Because in 2026, the United States, Canada, and Mexico will be hosting the World Cup. And one of the cool things that I got to know about you was that you actually were was a youth representative for the United States in hopes of bringing the World Cup to uh, not just the United States, but also Canada and Mexico, or basically North America. But I want to be able to ask, and I know you've been asked many times, what's it like to be speaking with people and telling people why it's important to bring the, bring the World Cup to the United States. But I do want to ask instead what it's like to focus on, I guess, the bigger picture, right? Because this is the first time where, if I'm, if I'm correct, that we're going to see three countries host a World Cup. And so what is it like to be a part of a bigger role, not just in bringing the, the game to the United States, but also to Mexico and to Canada, because this is another way of, I guess, global uh, bring, unifying the sport together, especially United States and Mexico and Canada, given that they are rivalries, but in a way it's like, hey, we may be rivals, but at the same time, let's bring the sport together and make sure that we everyone has a positive experience in 2026. Truthfully, I had no idea what I was signing up for when I sort of interviewed for lack of better words um, for that position. Um, U.S. soccer reached out uh, to a couple of athletes in the U20 system, both on the men's and women's sides. And they had us send in a video of like what football means to us, what soccer means to us. And um, I actually spoke about the experience playing against the Iranian team and um, just how powerful sport is when it brings people together. And they chose me. And I think that experience at the 68th FIFA Congress was probably one of the most special experiences I've ever had in my life. And to be a part of the, the movement to bring the World Cup to North America in 2026 as a part of a unified bid, um, I think changed the landscape for the future because now we're seeing more joint bids um, happening um, even in 27 when the Women's World Cup is bid for um, and then eventually for the succeeding men's world cups as well and i just cannot be more grateful for having that experience because i got to see the inner workings of fifa an organization i played for and hope to one day represent after my playing career um but to answer your question 2026 is going to help not only u.s soccer but also the other federations in north america achieve their goal of making football the preeminent sport in the united states canada and mexico We've got a wealth of other sports, like a wide variety of football, American football, basketball, baseball, soccer. But I think it's time to catch up with the rest of the world and play soccer here in the United States, Canada and Mexico. And to to share that collective love for the game is going to revolutionize the way we see sport of soccer in North America. So I'm ecstatic. I can't wait to be a part of it. I hope. My greatest hope for 2026, 2027, and 2028 is for it to be the best era of soccer in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, but specifically with the United States because we want to have the hosting rights for 2026 FIFA World Cup, the 2026 FIFA Women's World Cup, 2027 FIFA Women's World Cup, and then LA 28 with the Olympics. So um, and there's a lot to look forward to, a lot of moving pieces. But again, I am so grateful for that opportunity because it really did unite people uh, for North America. Yeah, and it's 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 weird because for Mexico, obviously the most popular sport is soccer. Canada, I feel like is more hockey, but soccer is more third or fourth popular sport in the, in the United States. And I think 
in these past few years, we've seen a lot of people get excited about soccer. So I think by having the 2026 World Cup, hopefully the 2027 FIFA Women's World Cup and the Olympics, we start to see more people being excited about the sport and following whatever, whatever whether it be the men's national team, the women's national team, or even the um, the ma- or Major League Soccer and the National Women's Soccer League and other soccer leagues as well. But I found out... I'm really, when- I'm really glad you brought I said I was really glad you brought that up because the national teams are great. They represent all of our countries, but the ones that keep those national teams successful are our are, are leagues in our homes, the National Women's Soccer League. For years, um, our players have been underpaid and still are to some degree. And, you know, the national team players have been able to have that successful career on the international stage. So what can we do to support our the National Women's Soccer League and then also Major League Soccer so that they can continue to grow and catch up with the rest of the world? So I'm that's what I'm most excited about. I think the World Cup is going to be incredible regardless, but the growth of the domestic leagues is going to really change the way we view soccer in America. Yeah, and hopefully people do sp- spend pay attention to more uh, when it comes to major league soccer and the other leagues as well, because people forget, I mean, we, most of us care so much about the premier leagues of the world and all the best leagues, but it's like, guys, we also have our own league. And while we may not be the best of the leagues, we still have a lot of exciting moments. And also I want to give a shout out to the national women's soccer league, because you also have a lot of exciting things as well. And so once we get more people excited about, the, league, the domestic leagues, whether that be Major League Soccer or NWSL, we hopefully more people get excited about soccer and wanting to pay attention more about uh, pay attention pay more attention to it. But I one of the things that I want to talk about aside from the athletic side is that your activism. You are someone that, like we mentioned many times, you don't want to just win on the field, but you want to win off the field. And you have this or this foundation, the Pinto Football Foundation, where you want to be able to give a voice to those who or give that platform to those who don't get who normally wouldn't be able to get it compared to other parts of the other parts of the world or or the United States. Where did the activism act? Where did the activism side of you come from? Because and especially it's a weird, weird state because athletes usually in the media, they'll go, you guys need to focus on the sports side because that's who you guys are. You guys are athletes. Where did the activism side come for you at first? Yeah, I think for me, it definitely came from the 68th FIFA Congress because I was um, a Black woman representing a Men's World Cup um, in a room that did not reflect all the people that play soccer across the world. Um, So to be advocating for the hosting rights um, to the 2026 FIFA World Cup, Men's World Cup, to be frank, especially in the political climate that we were in in 2018, it was a very powerful message. And I I said to myself, I don't ever want to come back to an environment that does not reflect all the people that play soccer across the world. I want to be a part of that change. And, you know, one of my goals is to work for FIFA um, after my playing career is over. And I feel like during my journey as a professional athlete, I I will do everything I can to bring more equity to the game. Um, I want more girls of color to to get into soccer and to love it just like I did and to have opportunity to meet new people from other cultures, uh, to travel the world, um, to try new things on the field and fail and, and then become successful because of the resilience that you learn from this game. Um, So specifically with Pinto Football Foundation, we want to invest in grassroots programming, um, host camps, give donations to local organizations that invest in the youth of tomorrow. Um, Those those girls and boys who are going to represent our national teams one day or um, go to college, we want to open doors of opportunity through the game of football. And um, we actually had our first event. Um, in conjunction with Beyond Our Game. So I teamed up with Courtney Williamson, the first Black captain of the UNC field hockey program, um, who I met during my time in college. And we wanted to be a part of the change of diversifying our sports and opening more doors of opportunity for people whom, who otherwise wouldn't have had a, a chance to fall in love with both sports. And one of the things on our, our the back of our shirt that Adidas sponsored 
Um, we added the Nelson Mandela quote, and it says, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they can understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. And I think that was really, really powerful because that it encapsulates what our mission was. Um, so we had a, a all day clinic and basically they got to see, um, they got to try field hockey in the morning. Um, they ha We had a DEI panel talking about our experience as student athletes at Carolina and what it's like sometimes being the only one on your team. Um, they got to see the field hockey stadium um, then they got to see the soccer stadium. Then they had the clinic with the soccer team. Um, so the UNC soccer players and NC Courage players came there to coach them and support them. And then we gave away a bunch of goodies at the end. And every girl left with a T-shirt, a field hockey stick, a field hockey ball, a soccer ball, um, and so many other goodies. And it was just such a success because um, we've just planted that seed that soccer can change your life. And we hope that you know that you have a place here in this sport or field hockey and that um, you belong. No, So no matter what sport you choose, just know that you should unapologetically be yourself, believe in yourself, and then use education to hopefully make those dreams a reality. Because we did want to stress that importance that education through athletics is a powerful way to change your life. Yeah, that's it's actually really interesting. And I, and I think what's really special about activism is that you you guys are human beings at the end of the day and i don't want to make the assumption that you're using activism as a way to promote yourself in a negative way but it's to be able to go like yes you are an athlete but it's about giving back to your community it's about being that being that voice to go hey guys let's find a way to not only make this better for ourselves but to make it better for everyone involved and one of the things about being an athlete and oftentimes, sometimes this is like it's a, it's a weird situation when people go, "Hey, let's find a way to be activists in our own community." Sometimes people will go, "I don't know about that. I'd rather just focus on the athletic side because that's who I am, or that's because some pe people are telling me, "Hey, you're an athlete. You're supposed to focus on the field, not what's happening off the field." As someone who's involved in both activism and and athletics, how do you try to get other athletes involved in activism? It doesn't matter what it is that they're in, but just in general, when it comes to the idea of giving back one way or another, how do you try to convince other people that this is actually a really good thing? Like I remind them that their voice matters, um, their platform matters, and they have an opportunity to lead the sport better than they found it. And ultimately, like I said, um, the platform that we have as a collegiate athlete um, or a professional athlete, it it reaches so many different people across our communities, across the country, across the state, whatever it be, may be. And um, ultimately I remind my, my peers that find something you're passionate about, find a way to uplift those in that community and give them an opportunity for their voice to be heard. Um, because again, we have the responsibility to speak for those who are not heard, to open more outdoors of opportunity, offer a helping hand, and ultimately to treat others as we'd like to be treated. And if we can lead by example, not only on the field, but off the field, um, it'll change our community for better. Before I let you go, you talked a lot about, you talked a bit about how you would love to work at FIFA but when your career is all said and done. Now, where do you do you have a specific goal in mind like do you want to hopefully become president what are some what do you what kind of role do you hope to have at fifa but more specifically let's say you do work at fifa what are some of the things you hope to change that hasn't been that hasn't that we haven't seen in the past yeah um i don't have a specific role in mind i, I definitely have an administrative role where i can have an influence over um how the game is run across the world um but the issue that speaks close closely to my heart is accessibility. I want to address that all across the world, which is what I'm starting with Pinto Football Foundation and what I hope to achieve through FIFA. I want um, there to be safe um, playing fields for everybody, um, accessible um, all, all days of the week at all, at all times of the day. Um, because in my experience growing up in a pay to play model, um, fields were rented out and you could only access them by being a part of your local youth club. And I feel like that is prohibitive to the participation of certain, certain socioeconomic groups. If you don't have the means to afford to play for a travel soccer team, you're excluded. And I just don't think that's a fair way to build a, 
a, a soccer culture here in the United States or anywhere. So um, again, I want to get more women into the sport or girls at a young age. Um, I want to make sure they have the resources and the care that they need to be successful for years to come. Um, so that also in, includes um, addressing the inve investment. Like I think right now we're seeing a lot of ACL injuries ahead of the Women's World Cup, which is devastating because so many of the best players across the world are getting hurt for arguably the biggest tournament of their lives. And I think that comes down to we're playing the same number of games um, as the men, but we're not nearly getting the same uh, level of treatment, like direct flights, because those, you know, those flights and those miles um, add up on your body. And they do take a toll of when you're playing, you know, a three game week, for example, we played Friday, we play Wednesday, and then we play Saturday and being able to make sure your body withstands that, especially as many of our players are preparing for the world cup, we need to make sure that the level of care matches that. So through FIFA, I want to address the accessibility, the level of care, um, the access to the game in the sense that having, um, fields access at any time of the day, having a local team to play for, um, being supported no matter your um, your age, your skin color, um, your religious beliefs, your, um, your gender, like whatever it may be, I want for everybody to have, have an opportunity to play the sport. Wow. Well, you may be an amazing athlete on the field, but you're an even better person off the field. And I do hope that there are more people like you because it, it goes back to kind of what we talked about throughout this whole episode which is that yes you are an athlete but more importantly you're a human being that wants to see other people succeed and i really do mean that i hope there are more people like you because we don't normally see that in this in the world that we live in today but i took so much of your time and i know you, how busy you are as an athlete but i just want to say thank you so much for joining the podcast and i wish you the best of luck with the season and hopefully um columbus beats uh, cincinnati when they play, but, um, but <laughs> nevertheless, you. um, yeah, good luck with everything. And thank you for everything that you've done on the field and off the field. Well, thank you for having me. This is really special. Again, I appreciate your support of the NWSL, the women's national teams, and, um, really the whole system because people like you are help how we continue to realize our dreams every day. Um, but again, this podcast is really special because, um, it shows, it shows the audience that you can be whatever you set your mind to. Uh, if you're willing to work hard for it and uh, chase your dreams day in and day out, uh, you can really do some special things. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. If you like what you saw, feel free to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram at the OMCG Podcast for more information on guests, preview clips, and more. Please continue to support this podcast in however way you're doing that, and I can't wait to see you guys in the next episode.